In this video, we're going to be discussing several muscles of the shoulder, in particular the deltoid and the supraspinatus muscles. And collectively, these two muscles are the two major shoulder abductors. We're going to begin by talking about the deltoid, which you can see over here in these three colors on the right side of the screen. So right here is the left deltoid. And the nice thing about this picture is it pretty well divides the anterior, middle, and posterior deltoids. So the deltoid is divided into three regions. But I want to make sure you understand that it's divided into those regions functionally, not anatomically. So in a lot of pictures you'll look at in textbooks and on the internet, there's kind of these clear demarcations between the anterior and middle deltoid and clear demarcations between the middle and posterior deltoid. In real life, there are not these demarcations. It's one continuous muscle. It just so happens that based on where the muscle fibers are relative to the insertion down here, it tends to promote slightly different actions of the muscle. And so these divisions right here that you see, and also the different colors representing the different regions, these are functionally different regions of the deltoid, but structurally you do not see this differentiation on a cadaver or in real life. So let's begin by talking about the three major regions. In red over here, we have the anterior deltoid. So you can see right here, the anterior deltoid originates from the lateral one-third of the clavicle right here. And then in green, we have the middle deltoid. This originates from the acromial process of the scapula, or just the acromion, sometimes it's called. And then the posterior deltoid over here in blue originates from the scapular spine. Okay. Now the deltoid itself is a convergent muscle. So if we look at the origin up here, if we count all three functional regions, well, the origin is very broad. And then as you go distally, the muscle actually converges into a single tendon down here, which attaches or we could say inserts on the deltoid tuberosity. Now the fact that the different functional regions, anterior, middle, and posterior, originate at different points relative to the same insertion point, it confers slightly different functions to the three regions. So the anterior portion of the deltoid over here primarily functions in shoulder flexion and internal rotation. Now when we think about the deltoid as a whole, we think about shoulder abduction. And it is true, the anterior and posterior deltoids do contribute a little bit to abduction, uh, but that's mainly the job of the middle portion of the deltoid. The anterior deltoid is mainly going to function in the shoulder flexion and shoulder internal rotation. When we go to the middle deltoid here in green, it's going to function mainly in shoulder abduction. Now, when the arm begins resting by the side, as you have here in anatomical position, that's at zero degrees of shoulder abduction. And it turns out at that point, if we start abducting the shoulder, the deltoid can function, but it really has a bad mechanical advantage until you get about to 15 degrees of shoulder abduction. So once you get past this point, then the deltoid, or particularly the middle deltoid, really starts contributing. Uh, before you get to 15 degrees, we'll see in just a few minutes that the supraspinatus actually plays a role until you get to 15 degrees. And then the posterior deltoid over here in blue is going to facilitate mainly shoulder extension and shoulder external rotation. Now the deltoid as a whole is innervated by the axillary nerve, which gets nerve root contributions from the brachial plexus, C5 and C6. And the blood supply is pretty extensive. We have from the thoracoacromial artery, deltoid and acromial branches, the subscapular artery, the anterior and posterior circumflex humeral arteries, and then the deltoid branches of the deep brachial artery. Now for a surface anatomy approach. So if the deltoid is hypertrophied enough and the body fat percentage is low enough, you can actually kind of make out three different regions of the deltoid. I know I said earlier on that there's not that clear demarcation. And when the muscle is kind of average sized, uh, you're not going to be able to see that. When the muscle hypertrophies enough, you can get a little bit of demarcation between the three segments of the deltoid. So over here anteriorly, of course, this is the anterior deltoid. Over here in the middle is the middle deltoid. And then back here is the posterior deltoid. So here's another picture. So what you see right here is the spine of the scapula. Here's the acromial process, and then over here is the clavicle. So we're looking at a posterior view because the scapular spine is only visible from the back. 
So over here, this segment would be the posterior deltoid. This would be the middle deltoid over here. And then actually the anterior portion of the deltoid, it looks like has been removed. And you can actually see these muscle fibers right here as they're converging down to where they will insert on the deltoid tuberosity, they actually have to cross through uh, the muscle belly of the triceps brachii, which is right here. And then once they pierce through that, they'll go down to the deltoid tuberosity. And we can also see several of the rotator cuff muscles. So over in this region, this in general is the infraspinous fossa. So right here we have the infraspinatus, and then over here is the teres minor. You can see a little bit of it there. And then down here, this is not a true rotator cuff muscle, but this would be the teres major, actually originating from the inferior angle of the scapula. But what I want to point your attention to here is the supraspinatus muscle right here, also colored in green. Now in real life, this is going to be covered up by the upper trapezius. Remember the upper trapezius goes from the midline all the way up from the top of the neck. And part of it's actually going to insert on the spine of the scapula right here. So the supraspinatus muscle belly will be covered up, but the upper trap here has been removed. Now in real life, you can get sort of an indirect feel of the supraspinatus, but you're going to have to poke pretty hard through the upper traps, especially if they're thick or tight, just anterior to the scapular spine, but posterior to the clavicle. So you should be able to get kind of a feel where the supraspinatus is. But where is the insertion? We can't see it here because it's actually covered up by the deltoid muscle. So we're going to remove the deltoid and see every single piece here of these posterior and superior rotator cuff muscles. Okay. So supraspinatus, it originates in the supraspinous fossa. So up here, basically anterior to the scapular spine, we have a little basin here on top of the scapula. This is the supraspinous fossa. This is where the muscle belly of supraspinatus sits. You can see here that it's also a convergent muscle like many of the other rotator cuff muscles. And it's gonna come over here and insert on the greater tubercle, okay? Now specifically, it inserts on the superior facet of the greater tubercle. There's only one rotator cuff muscle that does not insert on this and it's the subscapularis, which we can't see here, it's on the other side, it actually inserts on the lesser tubercle of the humerus. So all three of these rotator cuff muscles here, supraspinatus, infraspinatus, and teres minor, these all insert on different facets of the greater tubercle. So teres minor is on the inferior facet, infraspinatus is on the middle or intermediate facet, and that makes supraspinatus on the superior facet. Now, the supraspinatus, you can tell here, is a much smaller muscle than the deltoid. In fact, in real life, uh, it's actually a lot smaller than this by comparison. Okay? Uh, these pictures sometimes blow up these small muscles just so you can get a better feel for where they are in their anatomy. But in real life, it's actually smaller than this. So even though this is one of the major shoulder abductors, power-wise, strength-wise, it really doesn't compare to the deltoid. However, I mentioned that in the first 15 degrees of shoulder abduction, the deltoid really doesn't have a great mechanical advantage. It still can contribute, but it doesn't have the best mechanical advantage yet until we get to about 15 degrees. So especially in the first 10 or 15 degrees of shoulder abduction, the supraspinatus is really going to participate in that. So sometimes in the action here, you'll see it written, it initiates shoulder abduction. It's not so much initiating it, it just has a better ability to contribute to it in the first 10 or 15 degrees of shoulder abduction, okay? Now after that, it still contributes, but once you get to 15, 20, 25, up to 90 degrees, the deltoid has almost entirely taken over percentage-wise. Um, but the supraspinatus still does contribute at that point. The other action of supraspinatus, like all of the rotator cuff muscles, is to also participate in glenohumeral stabilization. So a lot of times if you have somebody with uh, some kind of shoulder instability, um, whether it's subluxation or something else, one of the things you actually want to do is strengthen those rotator cuff muscles because one of their major jobs is to hold that humerus into the glenoid fossa. And when those muscles get weak, in particular in a stroke, uh, you tend to have dislocations. And so a lot of times before someone's able to really work on their arm uh, following a stroke, they'll be in a sling. And it's a special sling designed to hold the head of the humerus in the glenoid fossa.
Okay, so make sure you understand that all of the rotator cuff muscles, not just this one, participate in that glenohumeral stabilization. And the innervation of, of supraspinatus is going to be the suprascapular nerve, which gets innervation also from the brachial plexus via nerve roots C5 and C6. And then its blood supply is via the suprascapular artery. Thank you for all your support. Be sure to check out my Instagram for cool science and not science stuff.